Hi, welcome back to the shop. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to replace the notoriously unreliable auto bed leveling probe on your Sidewinder X2 or Genius Pro with this inductive end stop. I got a lot to cover and you're not going to want to miss it. So let's get into it. Before getting too far into this, there are a few things that need to be taken care of. For starters, you're going to need one of these PEI coated spring steel build services. This one just happens to be my soon to be released EP3D branded one, but any brand of this will work just fine. And the reason for this is that the inductive probe can only trigger on the metal surface and not on the stock glass surface that the printer comes with. For tools, you're going to need a set of metric Allen wrenches or drivers, some extractors, wire cutters, wire strippers capable of stripping 22 and 24 gauge wires, tweezers, the aforementioned JST connector kit with the crimper. Additionally, you're going to need to 3D print a mounting bracket for the new probe and get a socket head cap screw M3 size 8 to 12 millimeters long. The probe we're going to be using is a GL8H type probe. This is the same kind of probe that you would install for a Z-axis end stop if you were to convert your printer to manual leveling only. The reason for choosing this is that they're small, accurate, inexpensive, and you could find them on almost any website that sells artillery spare parts. For the firmware side, you're going to need a laptop, printer face, STM32 cube programmer, and optionally a micro SD card. More on that later in the video. I will leave links for all this stuff, including the download for the STO files and the firmware files you'll need in the video description. We will start by relocating the connections for the probe on the main board. To access this, we're going to need to remove the bottom cover of the machine. Tip the machine on its side and remove the six fasteners holding the cover on. Be sure to hold the cover from falling when removing the final screw. Carefully open the machine and gently disconnect the cooling fan that is attached to the cover. When you unplug the fan, the socket side of the connector may come with it. If this happens, remove the socket from the plug and push it back onto the pins on the main board, ensuring the correct orientation shown on the silkscreen layer. Set the cover aside, then locate and unplug the probe connector. You will need to depin this connector and replace it with the three position one found in the kit. To do this, you will need to use a small screwdriver, pick, or extractor tool to press the locking tang down on the contact and gently pulling it out from the back. This can be a bit fiddly and may take several tries. If you are unable to remove the contacts or accidentally pull the wire out, don't worry, there is plenty of extra length in the probe wires to cut the connector off and crimp on new contacts. This will also be a good time to install the new connector on our end stop. If you are familiar with this task, go ahead and crimp on your new contacts, but don't insert them into the connector just yet. Then skip to the time curve I have displayed on screen. If you are new to this, continue from here and follow along. I do recommend practicing this a few times before going full ham on your machine. If you order the kit that I've linked, it should come with some wire for you to practice with. If you've got an artillery Z-axis end stop, go ahead and cut the connector off right at the base of the connector. If you've purchased a new sensor with a long wire, cut the wire off about two or three inches from the sensor itself. With your wire strippers, remove between two and three millimeters of the outer jacket. In your connector kit, cut off a contact flush with the back of the strain relief tabs. These contacts have three sections, the end that makes contact with the pin of the mating connector, the tangs that crimp onto the bare wire, and the tangs that crimp over the wire jacket to provide strain relief. I found the easiest way to crimp these is to pre-install them in the crimper. First, observe the crimping dies with them fully closed. Note which side has the larger holes. This is the side that crimps the strain relief. Finish squeezing the crimper down all the way, then slowly release it. If you have the pivoting jaw type crimper, it will be the end with the narrow die. If you have the sliding jaw type crimper, it will be the die that has the opening width that is the same width as the contact. Hold the end of the contact and place it in the appropriate crimp die with the open end of the tangs facing the stationary jaw. Holding the contact evenly between the two sections of the crimp die, keeping the tangs even in the jaw, slowly squeeze the handle till you hear the first click of the ratcheting mechanism, then stop. You can let go of the contact as it is now mostly secure in the crimper. Speaking of ratcheting mechanism, once this process starts, it cannot be released until the jaws are fully seated, so be extra careful not to get your fingers caught. 
As you could imagine, this would be a very unpleasant experience. Now insert the wire into the back of the contact far enough that the jacket of the wire is about 2 millimeters inside the contact. Hold it steady and slowly squeeze the handles till the crimping action is complete, then slowly release them. The newly crimped wire and contact will be a little stuck in the crimp die. Remove it by pulling it out of the die from the end of the contact, not the wire. Give it a good visual inspection and ensure the conductor and jacket are properly seated in the contact. Repeat this on the second probe wire and on the three wires of the new end stop. In your connector kit, grab a three position female end. If you look at the flat side, you will see a small triangle embossed on the plastic. This indicates position number one. On your new connector, the red wire will be inserted into position one and the white wire into position three. Ensure the contacts are fully seated. You can give the wire a gentle tug to verify they are locked in place. When you are done, connect this to the Z-Limit socket on the main board. This should be the green socket. And that's all that needs to be done on the inside of the machine. I do recommend leaving the cover off until we can verify that everything functions properly. Since we're here, we can give our new probe a new connector. You could reuse the old four position connector from the inside of the machine, or you could get a brand new one from your kit. The choice is yours. Insert the probe wires as follows. The brown wire into position two, the black wire into position three, and the blue wire into position four. When you are finished, go ahead and set it aside. Now it's time to remove the stock probe and install the new in-stop and 3D printed mounting bracket in its place. Start by removing the ribbon cable bracket by gently prying up on the locking tab until it pops off. Now pull the ribbon cable out. Remove the two screws holding the plastic cover and set it aside. The probe is attached with two screws located behind it. Remove these and put them somewhere safe as we will be reusing them. Then disconnect the probe connector from the breakout board. Now it is time to install the new mounting bracket. Reuse the screws from the old probe. Don't tighten them all the way just yet. We will need this to be able to slide up and down while adjusting the probe height. Grab the new end stop, then screw it into the mounting bracket with the M3 by 8mm screw and washer. This doesn't need to be very tight. The plastic shell is hollow here and will crack if it's over tightened. And connect it to the breakout board. Now manually move the gantry down until the nozzle just touches the build plate. Make sure the nozzle is clean to prevent any hardened plastic on the end causing an error in the offset of the new probe. With the nozzle touching the bed, adjust the probe height to give it a 1 to 2 millimeter gap. My scale just happens to be about 1.5 millimeters thick, so I will use it. Then go ahead and tighten the screws. This is easier with the print head moved close to the edge of the printer. Now get the cover and feed the ribbon cable through it. Then connect the cable into the breakout board. Make sure you push this in evenly and straight to prevent damaging it. Reinstall the cover with its screws. Then snap the cable clamp back in place. And that completes the hardware portion of this modification. Now it's time to update the firmware to match. Turn the printer on and connect it to your computer with the USB cable that was provided with your machine. Open up Pronterface and connect it using the appropriate COM port. When it's connected, click in the command bar and type M997 and hit enter. Now open STM32 Cube Programmer. Ensure USB is selected for the connection type, then click on connect. When it's done connecting, it will say data read successfully at the bottom. Now go to the erasing and programming page by clicking on the green button with the arrow pointing down. Click on browse next to file path and navigate to the previously downloaded file. Go to the firmware for your machine, then mainboard firmware, then click on firmware.hex and then click open. Now click start program. When it's complete, you will see a window pop up saying download verified successfully. Click OK, then OK on the next one. Disconnect and close this window, then go back to Pronterface and disconnect it as well. Power cycle the printer by shutting off the main power and disconnecting the USB. After a few seconds, power the machine back on and reconnect the USB cord. After updating the firmware, we need to reset the EEPROM. The probe offsets are persistent, 
and they won't update until this reset is done. Go back into Printerface and reconnect the printer. Click on the command bar again and type M502 and then enter, then M500 and enter. Now disconnect the program and the USB cable, then power off the machine. The stock TFT firmware should work just fine with this setup, but you could optionally update to the TFT firmware that I've provided in the download. It has my custom skin UI and some added functionality. To update the TFT, copy the contents of the folder labeled TFT firmware onto a micro SD card. Ensure it has a capacity of less than eight gigabytes and is formatted to a FAT32 file system. Insert the SD card into the slot on the printer and power it on. The screen will show it updating. This takes a few minutes to complete. When it's done, the screen will reboot. We will need to set the file source back to USB. Press settings, then file source, then USB. It will highlight when it's activated. And this completes the firmware portion of this modification. Before we can go on printing anything, a functional test of the new probe needs to be done. To do this, you're going to want to have your gantry about halfway up and have a metal object in hand, like an Allen wrench. Home the machine, and when the Z-axis begins to move down, take your metal object and touch the bottom of the probe. The Z-axis should stop moving down. If it doesn't stop, quickly shut off the machine to prevent the printhead from crashing into your build plate. Let me show you what that looks like. Go to Tools, Home, and Home All. The X and Y axis will home, and the gantry will come down. Now we know everything is good. If it doesn't work for you, you're going to want to go back and retrace your steps to figure out what's gone wrong. If your functional test was successful, you can go ahead and reinstall the cover back on the machine. Don't forget to plug in the cooling fan, or you might have some issues later. Ask me how I know. If you install the cover prior to doing this test, you're going to want to power cycle the machine to clear the error that we generated from our manual test. From here, we can get on to our test print. When you are done, you could set your Z offset to a corner leveling if need be. Then run auto bed leveling. When auto leveling is done, I've set it to save the surface map to the EEPROM automatically. Lastly, it's time to do a test print. In the downloaded file, there is a level test G code named for your respective machine. Copy that to a USB stick and print it. You can fine tune the nozzle height using the baby steps as it prints. When you feel it is just right, save it to EEPROM and it will update the Z offset. And there you have it, an inductive end stop as an auto leveling sensor. Gone are the days of your probe randomly deploying, crashing into your print, and breaking the tip off. For those of you who are pretty good at finding Waldo, you may have noticed something a little different about the print head at the end of this video. I began having trouble with mine, where my extruder stepper motor began to skip steps and stutter. For those of you who have had these kind of problems before, or general barbecuing of the print head on your X2R Genius Pro, I've got great news for you. Upon releasing this video, the long-awaited, highly anticipated EP3D extruder breakout board is available for purchase on my website at etherealproject3d.com. Also new to the website is our community forum. Come on in and join the conversation. If you like this video, please consider leaving a like, comment, and subscribing. It lets me know that these videos are helpful and you want more. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook at etherealproject3d, where I post about ongoing and upcoming projects. And if you want to support the channel further, consider buying me a coffee. Links to all this in the video description. Thanks for watching and happy 3D printing.